Welcome everybody to the Media Coast Pop-Up TV studio and newsroom. If I can start off by introducing Emma. Emma, can you just tell us a bit about yourself and why you have entered our studio today? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, firstly, thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and talk to you all, hear all your questions. Um, yeah, my name's Emma, Dr. Emma Nichols, but obviously do call me Emma. And um, I am Senior Curator of Natural Sciences at the Horniman Museum, which is in South East London. And Senior Curator just means someone who looks after the uh, objects and specimens in the collections. And I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, so that means I study um, fossil animals with a backbone like you and me. Have you known your whole life you wanted to be a paleontologist? And if not, what was your inspiration? I, I have known my whole life, actually, yeah. Um, so I decided um, I wanted to be a fossil person at the age of five. Um, I learned the word paleontologist a few years later. And I think uh, my inspiration um, probably started with my uncle Richard, who is a big monster film uh, fan. Uh, he works uh, as a film journalist, or he used to. And um, yeah, he, he introduced me to all these different monster films. And a lot of monster films involve dinosaurs. Um, and so that's where I think, it was a long time ago now, <laughs> that's where I think my inspiration first came from. Um, and then I just couldn't get enough of uh, paleontology and prehistoric worlds. So I would uh, read everything, watch any documentaries, um, and particularly uh, inspiring films from uh, my childhood, well, teens, I suppose, uh, Jurassic Park, which I'm sure you've all heard of. I was 13 when Jurassic Park came out. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of, um, lots of great books and films, but it definitely started with Uncle Richard, I think. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to come over to the very appropriately dressed I know lover Kira. <laughs> what is your favourite find and why? What's my favourite find and why? Um, so my favourite, can I have two? Is that yeah. allowed? Oh, good, thank you. That's very kind of you. The more the better, I think. Uh, so my f one of my favourite finds uh, was uh, from a theropod dinosaur, which is the kind that you have there. Uh, the theropods are the um, the ones that sit on uh, sat, sorry the ones that walk on their back legs yeah. uh, and they're carnivores, so they eat meat. Um, and I found what's called a phalanx, which is just a very fancy term for this bone here. Um, you have lots of uh, phalanxes or phalanges is the uh, plural there, each one of these. And I found one of those on the Isle of Wight. So that was very exciting. Uh, the other exciting, uh, my, my most favourite uh, find um, was a shark's tooth. And um, it wasn't a particularly exciting species, but it was the first fossil that I found and identified during my PhD research. Um, and I subsequently, after that, I um, uh, found and identified about 13,000 teeth. Oh. Um, so that first one <laughs> was very important to me. Brilliant. And I imagine you're looking for a career like Emma's, aren't you, Kara? Well, you yes. love to do that job. I got, I got like billions of books about them. I've got my two favourite two rexes <laughs> and I am a two rex. Brilliant. <laughs> Love That's it. Amazing. I, I'm just absolutely loving the way you've turned up to tonight's press conference. Thank you, Kira. I wish I'd dressed up. I should have done that as well. <laughs> <laughs> should have been a prerequisite, shouldn't it, Emma? Sure. <laughs> um, Julie, okay. Do you want to ask your first question? Okay, so my first question is why do you say it's important to discover fossils, bones, etc.? from extinct animals? Um, 
<clears throat> oh, excuse me. So there are um, a few different reasons that uh, fossils and paleontology are really important. Um, I'm going to give you four um, and then I'm going to tell you why two of them in particular are important. Um, so paleontology is about the study of fossils, um, any prehistoric plants and animals from days gone by, millions of years ago. And by looking at how animals and plants um, and their environments have changed over time, um, we, can, we can work out how they might um, change now. So the four, sorry, let me start again. So the, the four uh, really important things about paleontology is looking at, looking at how animals, plants and environments have changed over time, over millions of years. Um, how changes in climate uh, and environment have affected plant and animal life. So if you look out your window, <clears throat> you can see whether it's sunny or it's raining or it's snowing, that's weather. Um, whereas if you look at patterns in the weather over a long time, that's climate. They're, that's the difference between them. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, fossils can also tell us evolutionary history, which is just a fancy way of saying how things are related. Um, and they can tell us about the origin of life on Earth. Um, now, the reason I said two of them are particularly important now is because those first two um, are really relevant to uh, climate change in the modern day. So by looking at how plants and animals have um, changed because of climate change in prehistoric times, we can look for patterns and it will help us to um, predict or to guess, uh, educated guess, uh, what might um, happen with uh, modern climate change. Um, and that's really important in terms of working out um, what we can do, what we should um, prioritize in terms of trying to protect animals, plants and environments from modern climate change. I know that was a very long answer, but I, I, I could have gone on even more. So I hope that was uh, OK. <laughs> that was really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Carl, have you got a question? You've always got questions. What, what would you say to young people who want to become pale? Uh, it's a tricky word, isn't it? Go on, sorry again. Paleontologists. Yeah, well done. Excellent. It is a hard word, isn't it? Um, that's a great question, Carl. I'm glad that you asked that. Um, so the one thing that I think uh, is really important that everybody knows is that paleontology is a really varied subject. Um, so there are lots of different things you can do to be uh, as a paleontologist. So if you're uh, particularly good or um, you really enjoy uh, physics or uh, chemistry or biology, or engineering, um, if any one of those uh, is something that you really enjoy and, uh, and no doubt will, if you enjoy it, you'll probably have a bit of skill in it. Um, then you can, then there's definitely something in paleontology for you. So for me, I'm a paleobiologist, uh, which means that I study uh, fossil animals. Um, but whatever your interest is, um, if you want to go into paleontology, um, the thing to do at the moment is uh, just to work hard at school. Um, but yeah, like uh, Kira there, uh, she mentions she's got a lot of books. Read anything that excites you, anything that interests you. Um, if you want to go to university, um, if you want to do research in paleontology, going to university is, is a really good thing if you're able to do that. Um, or volunteering at a museum. Um, so I work at a museum, not all paleontologists do. So it's really varied. Um, and I think probably the most important uh, advice to give you is decide what you're excited about and then just read everything you can, watch everything you can, any documentaries and talk to people like me um, when you're a bit older and want to, or anytime, but specifically when you're a bit older and you're trying to decide what subjects to study, uh, because we can help you uh, 
um, work out what would be most useful for you for a career in paleontology. Brilliant, thank you, Emma. And and Carhall and Kira, we're very lucky where we are in Manchester that we've got a lot of great museums and we've got Stan, haven't we, in the museum near us? I do. And we, we've just been to see, um, Kira and Carhall did a Raven reporting mission for us where we went to see a play that was all about Stan the Dinosaur. Wow. Um, we've, we've had a real flurry of dinosaur activity at the moment. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's very exciting. <laughs> right. So Alec, Brody and Evie, have you got a question for us? How big was the largest T-Rex? How big was the largest T-Rex? plus testing your knowledge there Emma <laughs> yeah so I that's a very specific question which I like um I think the largest known t-rex is about six tons uh, so that's about six family cars um I think that female t-rex has got well scientists think that female t-rexes were larger than male t-rexes um but yeah I think in life it would have been about six tons I'm fairly sure <laughs> oh that is big isn't it Google, <laughs> just, just double check that though <laughs> um, and, um how how many plants could the stegosaurus eat whoa loads oh. loads and loads so okay, stegosaurus had um uh, a, a large body weight to uh, keep going. You need a lot of energy um, when you're a large animal. Um, you know, when you haven't eaten all day and you feel really tired, and then if you have some nice food, you, you feel much better quite quickly. Um, and you don't get a lot of nutrition, a lot of uh, goodness from plants. Um, so in order to um, keep your energy up and keep going, you have to eat a lot. And if you're the size of Stegosaurus, <laughs> Brilliant. And Evie, have you got a question? How small was the smallest dinosaur? So the smallest dinosaur that I can think of off the top of my head is one called Procum Sugnathus, um, which was about the size of a probably a small chicken. Um, I can't think of a smaller one off the top of my head. Brilliant, fantastic questions from you there. Great teamwork. Um, Julie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry. Um, I've got another question, which is how, what is the process of preserving the excavated bones or findings? How is it handled? Great question. Um, so I was talking to Kirsty before about maybe showing you some pictures. Kirsty, would that be okay? Absolutely, yeah, I would love to. Great, see. okay, so lovely. Because um, I can show you. Um, so recently uh, I was part of an excavation, a dig uh, for an ichthyosaur, which is a marine reptile. It's not a dinosaur, but it was around at the same time as dinosaurs. Um, and it was a reptile, just like dinosaurs, but it lived in the sea. Um, and this <clears throat> ichthyosaur was uh, a really important um, find for paleontology. Um, and so I put together some pictures of the excavation for you. And by showing you those, I can answer your question, Julie, if that's all right. So let me share. So let's go. Uh, I'll show you. I'll just jump to this. Okay, so this is what an ichthyosaur looks like. Um, this is a reconstruction of um, our ichthyosaur, the Temnodontus trigon Temnodontosaurus trigonodon, uh, which was found in Rutland uh, last year. That's a county in the middle of England, nearer, much nearer you than, uh, than me. And um, like I say, they're reptiles. So although it looks quite a lot like a dolphin, dolphins are mammals like you and me. Um, it also looks quite a bit like a shark, some sharks, like a great white shark, I suppose. Um, but they're fish, uh, whereas um, ichthyosaurs are marine reptiles. So that's what the animal you're about to see as a fossil looks like, would have looked like in life. And um, so what we do um, as, uh, well, let, let me jump ahead to, 
so that's the uh, specimen in the, in the excavation site. Uh, you're looking at the head end. Um, I can actually go back and show you. That's a picture of uh, me from uh, the the air, <laughs> an aerial shot. That wow. gives you an idea of how big it was. Yeah, absolutely huge. Um, so the head end is on the left hand side, that big sort of triangle. That's just the head. Um, and then you can just about see the four um, fi flippers, uh, the two four flippers. Uh, Ah, here. Can you see my mouse if I do that? Yeah. Oh, great. So there's the left yeah. one, there's the right one. And then the hind flippers are here. And then it's got this great long tail. Uh, but anyway, your question was, uh, what, how do we look after them? So um, the first thing to do is to what we call bagging and tagging. Uh, so anything, any of the fossil specimens that are not um, connected to the skeleton still need to be uh, put in a bag really carefully labeled and then taken away so they're not lost and uh, the process is um, just all about recording as much information and scientific data uh, yeah. as possible ah. so if you imagine um, a tooth <laughs> of a predator bless you was found uh, somewhere in the skeleton maybe between the two vertebrae two of the two of the bones in the backbone, that would um, suggest that something was eating this animal. And if you take that tooth away, that information is lost. So you have to write everything down. A sign, being a scientist is all about being really careful with information, just write everything down. Um, so that's what you do with the loose specimens, you take those away. Um, and then um, I'll jump to here. Um, so the larger sections of the ichthyosaur, uh, we took away in single blocks in what we call plaster jackets or field jackets. And what I'm doing here is preparing one of the hind fins for plaster jacketing. Um, and so what I'm doing is putting on some glue, it's called consolidant. And it's just a very, very watery glue that you put over the fossils, because although fossils um, are thought of as quite hard, um, and some of them are, a lot of them are very fragile, and certainly the ones in the ichthyosaur, a lot of them uh, were quite delicate. So you apply this uh, glue, and then you make a field jacket. Now, if you've ever broken your arm or leg, I hope you haven't, uh, I have, um, the plaster cast that you put on your arm is pretty similar to a field jacket. Uh, the layers are slightly different. Though. So the first layer that goes on after that glue has dried is just uh, tissue paper. It's actually special tissue paper called acid free tissue paper. And that's to protect the fossils, which, as I say, are quite fragile. Then you put on a uh, wet scrunched up uh, tissue, different tissue, just any tissue will do. Uh, so if you imagine two bones next to each other, there's going to be a gap between. And if you uh, carefully put in lots of scrunched up wet tissue paper, it fills the gap so you create a nice smooth surface. And then over the smooth surface, you can put uh, baking foil, just kitchen foil you have at home. Um, and then the, um, the messy bit, uh, you uh, get plaster of Paris and some hessian. Hessian is that, if you've ever done a sack race at school, it's that very um rough uh, brown open weave material and you cut hessian into strips put it in the plaster of paris and then put it over the baking foil and once it's hardened you then put another layer and another layer and another layer uh, and so once it's uh, nice and safe you can then um, take that field jacket away from the field site so that one on the right hand side um, is currently upside down because it's so heavy. It weighs about the same as me, that field jacket. Um, we've rolled it out of position, ready for the tractor to take away. Um, so it's only upside down uh, for a few moments. <laughs> um, what else was I going to tell you? Just trying to answer your question without going into too much detail. That's probably um, enough, actually. Did, did that answer the question, Julie? Or, should, or do you want any more information about? OK, great. <laughs> getting a big thumbs up so that's great excellent <laughs> i'm going to go over to asha next i know everybody's got lots of questions i want to get to at least one of you all get one question then we'll come back around again so asha if you take yourself off mute welcome to the media club's newsroom what was your favorite dinosaur and was it uh omnivore a carnivore or a herbivore 
I love that question, Asha. Thank you for asking me that. Um, I love a dinosaur called Ankylosaurus. And I have a model here, actually, if you want to see one. In case you don't know what it looks like. It's a bit dusty. This is Ankylosaurus. Can you see that? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so it's got all these plates, bony plates along the back and tail, and it's got this really big tail club. And that was for protection against predators. Um, and Ankylosaurus was a herbivore, so ate plants. Um, and I also really like Iguanodon, but I think Ankylosaurus is definitely my favourite. Do you have a favourite dinosaur? Yeah, it's Allosaurus is my favourite. Nice, good choice. <laughs> Ooh, I think we'll we'll have that at the end where I can ask you what all of your favourites are because I know you'll be bursting to tell Emma what they are. Uh, we've got a few people left who haven't asked a question yet, so we'll go to Amal and then to Nikita. What was your most exciting find? Most exciting find... So this, the ichthyosaurus just showing you was the most exciting excavation I've ever worked on because it was so important scientifically. Um, but the most, but I didn't find it. I was on the excavation team. It was actually found by a guy called Joe Davis. Um, so the most exciting thing I've ever found, maybe the first ever fossil I remember finding uh, which was when I was um, very small. I was in primary school, younger than all of you. And um, it was an ammonite. Do you know what ammonites are? They're the curly shells, like a squid sort of a, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, it's not a very good one. It's a rubbish fossil, actually. It's broken and uh, a bit squished, uh, but I still have it. And um, I was excited because it was the first thing I'd found myself. That was really cool. Brilliant. First ones are always important, aren't they? In anything that you do, it's always a memorable one. Definitely. Nikita, I know you've been bursting. <laughs> who ever, okay, so who ever looted from the Echinotosaurus? I'm not sure. Is it the, how do you say it? The, uh, the Ichthyosaurus. It's really hard, isn't it? Yeah. Ichthyosaurus. That's it. I'm sorry, Nikita, what was the beginning of the question? Who evoluted from the Ichthyosaurus? Like, who's the evolution? Oh, like, sorry. I yes. um, Like, what's it related to? Where did it evolve from? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear what you're saying. Um, good question. Excellent question. Okay, so um, Ichthyosaurs are uh, marine reptiles. Um, and so they are related to... Um, in the Mesozoic era, when they lived, which is the term that covers the Jurassic, uh, Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous, um, which is when the dinosaurs lived. So people tend to have heard of, heard of those. Um, the ichthyosaurs were related to other marine reptiles, such as plesiosaurs um, and thalatosaurs. Um, they were quite a diverse group. But in um, the modern day now, there aren't any ichthyosaurs around, uh, sadly, and there aren't any, um, they didn't evolve into anything new. So quite a lot of um, prehistoric animals, um, such as, uh, well, dinosaurs are a really good example. Uh, one particular group of dinosaurs, um, one of the theropods, they evolved over many millions of years to turn into birds. So all birds around today, they're all dinosaurs. They are all part of the dinosaur clade. Uh, but but um, ichthyosaurs sadly just went extinct um, about 90 million years ago. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's hard to recognize, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Freya, are you wanting to ask a question? You, you're busy? Yeah. yeah. Off you go. Um, what was your favourite dinosaur and why? Um, definitely the Ankylosaurus that I mentioned um, a little while ago. But why is it my favourite? Oh, that's a great question. So I think it's probably one of my favourites because it's um, it's just like a, a, a walking balloon tank. 
Um, so they they had quite sort of scientists think they had quite barrel like bodies, kind of like rounded balloon bodies. And it had so much um, what we call dermal armor, which is the, um, you know, like on a crocodile skin, you can see lots of individual kind of um, scales. They're actually called um, osteoderms, which is um, they're, they're tiny little bones in the skin. And that means that if you're uh, a predator and you try and bite down on a crocodile, you're likely to break your teeth because they have really hard backs. Uh, their tummy underneath is very soft. So if you're trying to eat a crocodile, that's where you would go for. Not that I recommend you eat crocodiles. Um, and ankylosaurs are, are like that. They have all these um, bones all over their backs. So I'll show you this. Um, I'll show you this again. So you see all those little brown bits? Uh -huh. They are uh, these osteoderms that I mentioned. And what's really interesting about it is um, most, by far, the greatest number of fossils um, were preserved in a water environment. It's very, very difficult to become a fossil if you're not anywhere near any water. And um, so any dinosaurs that lived on land uh, that have been preserved as fossils. They f either fell into the water or there was a flood or, you know, there had to be some kind of water involved for, for, for like 99% of fossilization. Um, and so with Ankylosaurus, it had all this heavy bony armor over the top of its big barrel body. And of course, if you put something in water uh, that floats, that's heavy on one side, what's going to happen, do you think? Uh-huh. What's gonna happen? It's gonna drop into the water. Exactly, exactly. And the heavy side's gonna go down first. So most ankylosauruses, ankylosaurs, are found that way up. Because that's how they've uh, that's how gravity works in water. <laughs> Amazing. I'm learning so much, everybody. It's fantastic. Um, I'm just gonna go back round again. So we started with Ethan. I think that's the fairest way of doing this. Ethan, Hello? have you got another question? Yep, sorry, my cat's in the way. That's okay. Fine by me. Um, <laughs> I kind of wanted to get this one out, and it's not really about um, paleontology. It's more of a fun question. Great. Okay. You go for it, Ethan. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? I'm glad that I had time to think about that beforehand because it was really hard to choose. And I'm going to assume that there aren't any uh, negative health side effects to just uh, yeah. to whatever I choose. I assume I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> lose my teeth or whatever. Um, so I had to choose between uh, marshmallows, marmite and crumpets. And I think I would have to go for marshmallows. If there was only one thing forever, Ooh. marshmallows. What about you, Ethan? Um, you've put me on the spot now. <laughs> it's hard um, to think, isn't it? Maybe but you can come back to you. Let us know when you think of something. Knowing what I've seen you week after week, Ethan, in these sessions, which you've always got this one of the same things to eat, maybe it's that. <laughs> Definitely an oasis as you drink, though. Yeah, my drink yeah. could be oasis, not the orange <laughs> summer fruit. It's very specific, Emma. Not the orange. It's got to be the summer. Fruit. Can't be the orange. Important to know what you like. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Here we go into sure. next. I think we'll go Carl and then um, Kira. If you've got another question. Um, I got two paleontologist questions and one fun one well let's just do one for now so we can get round everybody else how um, how did you feel when you were in that space excavating the ichthyosaur yeah um so i'm going to be very honest with you and say that i was about 50 percent really excited and about 50% absolutely terrified. And the reason uh, for the excitement is obvious, but the reason for the terror um, was because, so I've been on lots of fossil digs 
Um, I'm a professional paleontologist. I know what I'm doing. I wasn't nervous about my skills or, you know, experience or anything like that. But this particular uh, fossil was is so important. Um, it's the largest near complete marine reptile skeleton found anywhere in Britain. And if we're right about the identification, it's the first time this species, Temnodontosaurus trigonodon, has been found anywhere in the world outside of Germany. So it's really important uh, to science. Um, and because of that, I was terrified that, you know, even if you're a, a, a really um, careful, skilled uh, scientist, you know, what if you accidentally trip over or um, and break a bone or, you know, something silly like that? So there was this little voice in the back of my head saying, don't break anything, don't break anything. Um, not that I, I, and I didn't, thankfully. Uh, and there weren't really, there weren't any accidents on site at all, actually. But um, yeah, when I first arrived on day one, 50% excited, 50% terrified. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. We really appreciate your honesty and I'm sure we can all understand how that must have felt doing something so exciting. Kira, next question. Uh, 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 what books would you like to recommend to our paleontologists and traders like to be? Sorry, say that again. Say again for me. But like information would you like recommend to like paleontologists and really like this? Ah, well, that's difficult because you are not just your average child. You know a lot about dinosaurs. Yeah. So you need a book that's going to keep you interested, tell you something new that you don't know already. So what book would I recommend? Actually, I have a really good one here. Hold on. Um, it's by someone you might have heard of. Uh, where is it? Just struggling to spot it on my giant bookshelf. Oh, where's it gone? I'll show you another one in the meantime. So I was going to show you one um, by Dean Lomax, who I'm sure you've heard of. Oh, I found it. I found it. <laughs> we have heard of Dean Lomax. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you might have. I haven't. I haven't. Oh, well, he's lovely. Oh, and he's a, he's a very impressive paleontologist. Yeah. And he knows all about dinosaurs. Uh, and this is one of his most recent books. Can you see that? Okay. It's called Ten Dino uh, Dinosaurs, Ten Things You Should Know. And it's a very good book. Um, it's got a nice shiny cover. Um, so, yeah, I think you should be going for something a bit more like that. Because anything for, uh, for your age group, I bet you know it all already, Kira. Yeah. <laughs> well, great recommendation, Kira. Ella Dinosaur says, I think I was five. <gasps> Amazing. This, well, when I was five, I got the kids. That was <laughs> the first one, was it? Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, I still have the first answer I ever got too. <laughs> it's not that impressive. Mine's, mine's rubbish, but I still have it. <laughs> right, shall we go to Alec, Brody, and Evie? Yeah, Alec? you ready? ready? Alec, come. Um, do you, how does a, how many it can evolve. Uh, I have two questions. The, the first one, I'm gonna gonna leave, and the second one, the worst questions before it. So this first one is a fun one. How what? can a velociraptor eat how many meat? How much meat can a velociraptor eat? Yeah. That's the question. So not as much as you might think. Velociraptors aren't actually that big. Velociraptors um, were made famous in Jurassic Park um, for being quite large um, and um, voracious predators, which means really scary and um, able to take uh, large prey. Um, but Velociraptors were actually only about the size of a turkey. Um, 
so they they would eat meat they were carnivores but they probably wouldn't eat anywhere near as much as something a jurassic park velociraptor which is about the same size as me uh would have gone for and actually those um those velociraptors in jurassic park were probably um they're probably a lot more like something like a utah raptor a Utah raptor, which is a much larger raptor. The raptors are a quite um, varied group. There are lots of different raptors. Brilliant. Thank you. I love that you're very much focused on what they eat, Alec. <laughs> 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 Next question. Can we go to Brody? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's going to be two questions about raptors. Oh, we love How... How... How much... Can wait, let's start again, but not without <clears throat> how much friends can a Utah raptor make? Because all packs and, and herds are made out of friends. Yeah, so, uh, well, yeah, I think all the good herds and packs are made of friends, definitely. But there are some herds and packs that have um, have some of the same animal come in that want to take over. So any herd or pack um, normally has a dominant animal and it can be a male or a female, depending on the species. Sometimes it could be either. Normally it's one or the other. Um, <clears throat> and so take take uh, raptors for example um so you said a utah raptor uh, so utah raptors probably would have hunted in packs um and they probably hunted in packs of maybe 10 to 20 i would guess uh but if um the dominant one the one that's in charge if it started to get a bit old uh or maybe it hurt itself which um can happen unfortunately um then one of the younger ones probably would have tried to take over um so although we have herds and packs and everybody in our herd is a is a friend um it would have been a lot tougher if you had been a uteraptor i think fantastic thank you and evie round off is there any facts is there any interesting facts about anything at all? Can I pick an interesting fact? <laughs> anything yeah. we may not know. That's a good question, Evie. Something that's maybe not always talked about. Ooh, something that's something we don't know. Well, the colour of dinosaurs is very interesting. Shall I tell you a fact about the colour of dinosaurs? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so dinosaurs like this, that you've seen a few times now, um, we don't know what colour they were. And uh, when I was at university many years ago, uh, we thought that we would never know what color dinosaurs were because fossils are the color of rocks. They don't preserve the color of the animal. However, um, within the last 20 years or so, uh, there has been a revelation of, uh, no, sorry, 30 years, I would say, there's been a lot of um, what we call dino birds coming out of China. They started flooding out of China in about the 90, 1990s. Um, and dino birds are, you might have heard of Archaeopteryx, which is quite a famous feathered um, prehistoric bird. And um, animals such as the such as Archaeopteryx helped to prove this link that we were talking about earlier between dinosaurs and birds. And then in the 1990s, all these dino birds started arriving. So we were talking earlier about um, um, evolution and what's related to what. So if you have dinosaurs over here and birds over here and one involved, one evolved into the other, you have a number of uh, species or a time period where they are, they still have dinosaur characteristics like teeth, but they have bird characteristics as well, like feathers. Um, and these are the dino birds. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sort of simplifying this a little bit, but... <laughs> And there's a particular dino bird. I might be able to show you a picture while I'm talking, if I can spot the book. Oh, I can. Um, 
So one particular dino bird is called Sinosauropteryx, which is a great word to say. I love saying that. And um, under a microscope, a really high powered microscope, some paleontologists discovered these tiny, tiny little um, uh, shapes like spheres or oval, oval shapes. And by comparing them to, to the feathers in modern birds, they worked out that the color in bird feathers is actually preserved, some of them. And so this orange and white striped picture is what Sinosauropteryx would have looked like. And it had this stripy tail. And we know that because of these tiny, tiny microscopic, um, kind of like oval shaped balls uh, <clears throat> in the feathers on the tail. And uh, sorry, in the feathers on the body and tail. Fab. Right, girls, I know you've all got your hands up, but I'm trying to stick to the same order because we've never had such a popular hands up Emma, in one of our newsroom um, interviews. But Asher, I think you were next. Oh, sorry, Asher, you are on mute again. Do you know how to do it now? There we go. Um, why, um, did the dinosaurs, um, if they were carnivores, um, will other carnivores sometimes fight with other carnivores or, or sometimes to fight with their, because they don't want others to have their territory? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a few different reasons why carnivores might fight each other. Um, carnivores don't tend to eat other carnivores, uh, but there are still lots of reasons why they do unfortunately fight. Um, so one of them, as you say, is over territory. Um, another reason might be we talked a little bit earlier about having a pack of a particular species like Euteractor or Velociraptor. Um, and if the dominant one uh, was sick or old, there might be a fight um, for a, a younger one to take over the pack. So they might fight for that reason. Um, they also fight over girls. Uh, so boy carnivores quite often fight each other um, because they want um, uh, to be the boyfriend of all the girls in the pack. Um, they also fight over food. Uh, so if um, if uh, so, so when you hunt something, whether you're on your own or in a pack of animals, it takes a lot of energy. So we were talking earlier about how much food the Stegosaurus eats. And Stegosaurus is a herbivore, so it doesn't have to chase anything. But if you're a carnivore, you need a lot of energy to chase down your prey, uh, the things that you're going to eat. And... Uh, oh, sort of lost, lost the, I've lost my train of, chain of thought. Oh, yes. Um, and so food doesn't come very easily to carnivores. Um, and so if you've got a pack of, say, 10 Euteraptor, for example, and they've managed to take down um, a, a, a sauropod, maybe a baby sauropod, there's only so much meat that's going to go around. So they would probably fight each other over that as well. There are lots of reasons why carnivores fight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Amal, and then Nikita, and then Julie. Um, my second question is, how can you tell the difference between the fossils that you find? Great question. So um, if you found something like an ammonite, uh, the ammonite fossil would be pretty much the whole animal. You're, you're missing um, the soft parts, the sort of squiddy tentacles, they won't be there. But the shell, you'll probably find the whole shell. So you can um, compare it to um, either other fossil ammonites. If you work at a museum, you can compare them to other ammonites in your collection, um, or you can compare them to what we call the scientific literature. So in order to um, name a new species, you have to publish it so that everybody in the world can see it. And you have to have photographs and a really good description. And so you can use this scientific literature uh, to work out what you've got. But if you find something 
like uh, um, an individual bone, um, say that phalanx I told you about earlier, the finger bone that I found, that I found um, of a theropod, that's just one bone of an entire skeleton. And it's quite often that you will only find a few bones, maybe, be, maybe even just the one. And that's much harder then to work out what you've got. Um, so again, there are individual, um, what we call characters, which is the shape of different bits of it. Um, and you can compare those to other things that are found in the same uh, geographical area, so in the same place, um, and it also in the same time period. So the ichthyosaur that I've shown you a couple of pictures of, that's from the Jurassic period. So if you found um, something, if you found uh, a bone of an animal that you knew was from the um, Cenozoic, it was another random period. Uh, you wouldn't compare it to ichthyosaurs from the Jurassic. You wouldn't compare it to any ichthyosaurs because they didn't live in the Cenozoic. Um, so it's about playing a really big game of snap. Uh, this is what I've got. This is what it looks like. What looks like it? <clears throat> Brilliant. Great analogy <laughs> as well. <laughs> Nikita, I'm going to come to you next. And then Freya would just tell me she's got a question and then we'll leave yours till last, Julie, because I know you want to ask the last question. And those will be our last three questions for tonight because we have had so much time, haven't we? But I feel like we could just do another whole hour with Emma. We'll have to get her back again. Um, Nikita, you're next. Okay, so my first thing, remember when we were talking about the dinosaur birds? I've seen one, I'm not sure what the name was, but there's one with like really colorful feathers from the arms that go droop down. It has this like long beak, not beak, like kind of like a, it's like a crocodile and a bird kind of connected with like really long wings. Do you know what that might be? It sounds like, is it a really large one? Yeah. It and sounds like, like a thing called a Therizinosaurus. Does that sound familiar? I don't have anything to show you to sort of um, describe it, but it has, yeah, it has really long um, feathers. It's got very long claws, really long claws. Yeah. Yeah, Therizinosaurus is the answer to that. Also, so the media cups question that I was going to ask is, how many days did it take you to dig up the Ithiosaurus? If Sorry, it's the stories, I think. Well done, brilliant. Um, sorry, how many people or how many days did you say? Sorry, how many days? Days. Uh, so we were on site um, for 14 and a half days, but um, each day we were on site were about 12 hours a day. So if you were only on site for um, you know, a nine till five kind of a day, it would have taken a lot longer. So you'd have to work out how many days that would be if um, if we weren't doing such long days. But yeah, 12 hour days, 14 and a half days. Wow, that is a long day, isn't it? <laughs> so you must have had to have, was there lots of little areas in that period? So you bring floodlights in and stuff for you to be able to do it? Well, we were excavating in August uh, last year. So we went on to, we were staying on site. Um, and so as soon as we got up and had breakfast, we could go out into, onto the excavation site. Um, so we were, we were on site where, this, um, where the um, ichthyosaur was from about 8, 8.30. Uh, and then we worked till about half seven, 8, 8.30 when it was just getting dark. Um, so we worked all the daylight hours. <laughs> advantage of the long summer days. Yeah, absolutely. Freya, over to you. If you were a um, sweet, what sweet would you be and why? If I was a sweet. Sorry for the curveball there, Emma, but this is a no, question, that's fine. question that we love to ask in the media. <laughs> I'm going to have to give you an off the top of my head answer. So I'm going to be thinking about this all evening and I might come up with a different answer later. You know how that happens sometimes. Um, okay, off the top of my head, what sweet would I be? Well, I really like Werther's Originals, but I really am very concerned about the amount of plastic in the world. Um, it's a very 
worrying problem. So I'm not going to be a suite that's wrapped in individual plastic. I'm going to be fruit pastel. Ah, the the uh, the red the red one, the red fruit pastel. Oh, yum yum. yum. <laughs> Very specific, and yeah, <laughs> you, will, you you certainly will be thinking about it for most of the night, Emma. I, I was expecting, two a.m. I'll have a thought. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting marshmallow. Well, does that not count? Not quite. As well, does that count? Yeah. Uh, that count? Would that have counted? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah okay. Oh, marshmallow then. <laughs> um, and I also have another one as well as: um, Would you rather be a dog or a cat? I would like to be a sheepdog with long fur. Ooh, lovely. <laughs> and we will, that was a very kind would you rather question as well there, Freya. We've had much trickier ones. <laughs> really? And Julie, you're going over to our final question of the evening. Um. Well, my question is, sorry, just finding it. If you were a dinosaur, what would it be? What dinosaur would it be? And why? Let's add a why on the and end. And why? <laughs> I would be a triceratops because I think Tyrannosaurus rex was really cool. But I think it'd be quite hard, be quite hard work to be a T-Rex. We've talked a lot about uh, what it's like to be a carnivore. You, you know, you have to chase your prey. You have to find food. If you're not into chasing things, you have to scavenge. Um, yeah, that's tough. That's a tough life. So I'm going to be a Triceratops because they were around at the same time as Tyrannosaurus Rex. So from a safe distance, I could watch the T-Rexes and I could, um, you know, maybe I could be friends with a baby one, perhaps. Um, but yeah, from a safe distance from the adults, because they would definitely try and eat me otherwise. Yeah, <laughs> Triceratops. That is a great answer. What about you, Julie? Just, just which one you'd be, don't need the why. We'll just do a quick fire round to all of you, which one you would be. I have no idea. I don't really know the species of dinosaurs. <laughs> You know much more now, though, don't you? After an hour, so you can have a think and tell me next week. Amal, what about you? Probably a T-Rex. T-Rex, all your best wash out, and then Emma. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can be friends anyway. <laughs> Kira, do I need to even ask you which dinosaur would you be? T-Rex. T-Rex. <laughs> Carho? A velociraptor. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Asher? An Allosaurus or a Tarbosaurus. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Great choices. Lots of theropods. I respect <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, a Mosasaurus. Oh, nice. Okay, great. Marine reptile. A lot of knowledge there, Asher. Well done. Yeah. And we're going to go over to the triplets because I know it's getting close to your bedtime. So what are your favourite dinosaurs and which one would you be? Let's go. Alec first. Yeah. Which, is, which dinosaur would you be? Okay, so I would be a stegosaurus or spinosaurus. Since I'm distracted, I've always the stegosaurus. Not going to go for the spine sauce. So, if some of you have this, we we scare you. So, I would just be the sticker sauce from now on. Oh, great choice. Alex and then Evie. Brody. Oh, Brody, sorry. What dinosaur would you be? Well, I would be a Veloc Veloc Utah Raptor because they are so fast. And they're my favourite dinosaur from Jurassic Park. Great. <laughs> Fast, aren't they? And Evie? Pterodactyl. Oh, nice. Good one. Good one. In the air. <laughs> Ethan? Um, this is quite hard to pronounce, but it's another theropod, a Yangtuanosaurus. 
Oh yeah, nice. You did a great job of pronouncing it. Freya, which is yours? I would have to go for a triceratops as well. Yeah, there are yeah. two of us in the world. <laughs> and Nikita? I'm gonna have to say the what the but it um say if I got this wrong, but this is Saurus, the one with the big wings. The bird one. What's which one, sorry? one was that? The one with the big wings. Was oh, Rizinosaurus. Oh, yeah. There is an Asaurus. Yeah, great. There is an Asaurus. It's a great dinosaur. And I think I would be a Diplodocus. Nobody oh, cool. Diplodocus, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Emma. I feel like we have learned so, so much from you tonight. And I think we've got some people who might be following in your footsteps with their career choices in the future. Okay. And um, it, can we all just give Emma a big round of applause, please? Take yourselves off mute. Everything here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.